Zij wordt geïnterviewd door Arjan Peters. Dat interview duurt een klein uurtje, daarna is er kort tijd voor een paar vragen uit de zaal. Um, en daarna willen we u van harte uitnodigen om nog even te blijven, uh, na te praten, na te borrelen. Uh, Boekhandel van Stockholm is hier aanwezig met de boektafel. U kunt daar boeken aanschaffen en laten signeren. Uh, Hanja en Kihara blijft uh, heel even om een paar boeken te signeren. Dus wacht ook niet te lang met de rijden. <lacht> Um, ik wil ook nog even u aan het festival. Dit ja. fantastische festival, dat begint over precies een maand vandaag, Crossing Border Festival. Heel veel muziek, uh, maar nog veel meer literatuur en hele gave literatuur ook. Dus uh, ga vooral even kijken op de website en koop meteen een kaartje. Uh, en voor nu wil ik u een hele fijne avond wensen. En graag een heel groot applaus voor Arjan Peters en Hanja en Janneke Haan. your visit to Holland with this conversation here in The Hague, isn't it? Right, so, don't disappoint me. <laughs> <laughs> a famous cooking show on the Dutch uh, television is called Heel Holland Wacht. Mm -hmm. You know it already. No, I'm just lying. Have you seen yes. the television <laughs> yesterday, perhaps, in Amsterdam? But uh, since the publication of the Dutch translation of A Little Life, in April 2016, we can add to that jolly statement the sentence, Heel Holland huilt, <laughs> weeps, <laughs> cries, because almost everyone who reads this book is deeply moved by it. The story follows four men in New York from their younger days till the end, but in the heart of the book, Jana Kihara focuses on the lawyer, Jude St. Francis, his tragical background and his efforts to overcome the scars of his dark past. A Klein Leven is her second novel. Jana Kihara's debut is The People in the Trees, which reveals the title, which reveals more than the Dutch uh, title does, Notities uit the Jungle. The story is set in 1950 about the doctor, Morton Perina, who discovers a lost tribe on a Micronesian island, and who also discovers that people can reach an unbelievable high age if they make use of the meat of a specific turtle. Well, Perina earns the Nobel Prize for his discovery, but the big scandal will uh, devastate his career. That was your book three years ago. And uh, we start this conversation, well, perhaps in a probably unexpected way, uh, with your humor and the satirical elements in your latest novel, A Little Life. Uh, one of the main characters with the Dutch name Willem is an actor. And you enumerate some of the movies he acted in. And I uh, quote the titles The Stars Over St. James, Life After Death, The Poisoned Apple, and The Unvanquished, which, which is an existing uh, film, a film in 1964. 1964. Are our film titles? so unoriginal that you could invent this whole list. Well, I should say that um, the words satirical and humor are very rarely uh, attached to this book by critics, so thank you. <laughs> um, but, you know, people, I did want to create two um, kinds of art within this book. 
the first you mentioned are the films that, that Willem does, and the second, as we talked about a little beforehand, mm. were, was about JB's series of artworks. And they're both, I think, as you mentioned, a nod to um, a kind of title and a kind of naming and a kind of, of artwork that we have in this age. I mean, uh, JB's are, one of his series is called Everyone I've Ever Loved, Everyone I've Ever Fucked, and so on and so forth, which is a nod to Sarah Lucas and some of the young British artists. But I think that this is the way of naming, the, the concepts behind Willem's films and behind JB's art, also tie the book to a particular historical era. You know, as many of you know, there, who have read the book, there are no dates in this book. Mm -hmm. um, it's never set, in, a time is never mentioned, a year is never mentioned. And yet, there is, I hope, a communication through the kind of artwork that people collect in this book, through the kind of art that they make, um, it, something that grounds it in, in the present day and even into the slight future. So, so I try to, to indicate time in that way. So when we uh, see the, the, the titles of uh, the installations by J.B., uh, The Narcissist Guide to Self-Hatred, mm. or uh, the painting Even Monkeys Get the Blues, mm. Um, then we have to think this is the 19th, this is, these are the 80s. Not necessarily the 80s. This is such an obscure reference, but for people who do follow the art market and who do collect art, there's a part in the first section of the book when uh, JB and his friends are at one of his colleagues' parents' apartments, and the parents have a collection of art by, uh, by Bertinsky and by Arbus and uh, by Gursky, and this is, this is a very obscure reference, but th that is the kind of collection you would have if you were in New York and you were rich and you were trying to show off in the early 2000s. And so what I wanted to do with time is that it, it moves elastically in this book. Sometimes it moves at the pace that it should, sometimes it stretches, and sometimes it shrinks. But I think if the reader, the reader can choose not to see time at all, but if she's looking for signals, she might assume that it begins in the 2000s and it goes into the 2030s or 2040s or so. You know, one of the tricky things about time in a novel when you don't have dates is how you, you want to indicate to the reader that time is moving and it's moving forward. Mm -hmm. But you can't be completely truthful to the present day. So yeah. these characters should be texting more than they do in this book. Mm -hmm. But technology is a very <coughs> tricky thing to put into a novel because it dates so quickly, and because you're asking technology to do more work than it should, I think. Okay, so you don't make allusions to the actual uh, uh, world outside mm. these, this community, right. but you make use of, of implicit uh, allusions. Right. That we, we can uh, know in which time this novel plays, right. or the chapters. Or you can ignore it. Yes. yes. <laughs> so why did you choose that form of not uh, being too specific with dates? Well, a couple of things. I wanted to write a New York novel, but I didn't want, this is not a New York novel the way, say, Bonfire of the Vanities is a New York novel. No. It's a fairy tale about New York, and it's, um, it's a psychological study of New York. And so while there's no 9-11 in this book, there's no financial crisis of 2008, there's no um, politics in this book. You never know who the president is. Um, you instead have uh, the characters' shared ambition. You have their sense of competitiveness. You have their fetishization of success. And these are all things that make a New York novel a New York novel. Less than, I think, who's happened, who happens to be mayor, who happens to be president. Someone once told me, and I thought this was a really wonderful comparison, that it was somewhat like Bret Easton Ellis's American Psycho, which is another fairy tale about New York. This one is, that book is very grounded in the particular. It's grounded in brand names and a particular era, but there's also something feverish about it. There's something unworldly about it. And when you remove time, when you remove dates, when you remove the outside world from a novel, you're trapping your readers in a very small emotional universe. So nothing else matters besides these four characters and what they're experiencing. And it, it, I hope the experience feels intimate, but also claustrophobic. And the other way I try to enhance that sense of intimacy is there's very little sense of the city. 
So most of the action takes place in apartments, mm -hmm. in studios, in offices, the places that New Yorkers live their lives. But they very rarely venture out into the streets of New York, into the great landmarks of New York. It's more a novel about what brings people to New York and what makes them stay there than it is about the rhythms of the city itself. So by staying inside, they are very, they, they are New Yorkers. Yes, they are New Yorkers, but it's, <laughs> This is a, I can't believe I'm using a marketing term, but Instagram, if any of you are on Instagram, speaks of itself as a closed garden, by which it means that once you're in the, this particular kind of social media, you can't get out of it. And in that way, I think that this book also functions as a closed garden. I kept thinking of that great Oscar Wilde story about the giant in his garden. And in the same way, I think, once you're in the world of these characters, there's nothing you can turn to to explain their actions. You can't say, well, they're acting like this because the financial crisis has just happened and everyone in the city feels anxious. Or they're acting like this because it's the height of the AIDS epidemic and no wonder they might be frightened. They're, you're only, all you're given to, to look at and to deal with is their particular, particular responses to their relationships with one another. And I hope it feels slightly oppressive, but I think it also heightens the reader's relationship with the characters. And that uh, claustrophobia you mentioned, that, that you, uh, um, that, that very many readers, I guess, have experienced <coughs> while reading the book. Um, did you experience itself, yourself, while, you're, while you wrote, while you invented it? To some extent, you know, there's, and any of you who are artists of any kind will know that if you're very lucky when you're in the act of creating something, there is a point in which that work of art begins to feel more real than life, mm -hmm. in which it begins to feel that you're no, no longer creating it, but at some point that you are unable to, to map, it starts creating itself, and you're there as the chronicler. You're only there to be the executor of whatever the story wishes itself to be. And so it did feel like I was being led often, and that's both a disconcerting feeling and a wonderful one, um, because it happens so rarely when you're working on something. It, it never happened with the first book. No. And I felt that I had lost control to the book. Um, so when it does happen, whether you're painting something, or writing something, or composing something, it is a glorious feeling, in part because it's so rare. Um, your first novel, The People in the Trees, was, was dedicated to your father, um, with the German uh, quote. Mm. Uh, from Goethe, mm. vom Vater uh, Lust zu formulieren. Mm. That's the, 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 what the quote says, but the poem of Goethe uh, goes like this. Vom Vater habe ich die Statur mm. des Lebens Ernstes führen, vom Mütterchen mm. die Frau Natur und Lust zu formulieren. Mm. So Goethe had the Lust zu formulieren from his mother, yes. and you from your father, would you suggest that? I would, you know, I think most artists and, and many fiction writers come from, and this is reductive, but come from one of two kinds of families, either with parents who didn't let them be writers, or from parents who really encouraged it. And I was lucky enough to have a father who was, um, who was a doctor and has an inventive mind, and encouraged confabulations of all kinds, uh, and, and, and thought that they were entertaining and worthwhile. And it's a wonderful thing to have in a parent who thinks that um, the creation of a fantasy world um, and the bending of truth is something to be encouraged and to be enthusiastic about. Until, of course, he gets you into trouble later on. But, <laughs> but, but he's very tolerant of it. And, and but he was, he was someone who, who invented uh, fairy tales, perhaps, for you when you were a child? He didn't invent stories so much as mm. he did. Um, he was very playful with language, and many of the books that I read, how I learned to read fiction is because of him. I mean, the, the books that, um, that shaped my childhood, uh, Naipaul and Roth and, and Nabokov, were from him. Um, and, and he had a great, and has a great love for how, um, how language can be used and manipulated and played with. And so he was very playful with language that way. 
with this book, although I later figured out, thanks to the translators here, there's a huge mistake in it, a medical mistake that he promised me he had fixed and then he never did. <laughs> but uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is if you haven't already picked it up yourself. But he was the one who helped me a great deal with the science in this book and manipulating the science of this book as well. And, and that fault isn't, uh, that is this uh, uh, resolved by the Dutch translators? No, I think they were the ones who caught it and fixed it. Uh -huh. uh, translators catch all sorts of terrifying mistakes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mine have caught many, so. Um, this is the moment to mention the, name, the names of the Dutch translators. Josephine Ruitenberg and Kitty Pauls, and they're here yes. on the front row. <laughs> in New York for travel and, and style uh, magazines. Um, but in the meantime, you wrote secretly for almost 20 years in your first novel. That was published uh, three years ago. It sounds unbelievable that this 750 pages of this second novel took you only 18 months. Uh, can you explain the extreme difference in pace between writing this one and this one? No, I mean, I, I, I think your first novel is very difficult to write, especially when you're writing it in secret, as I was. Um, it, this is, it was a much... Well, why, why was it in secret? Well, anyone who works in publishing or in media knows that there's always someone writing a, writing a novel, and when the office is at the busiest and you need the printer, they're always printing out their book, and it's always about 500 pages, and you're standing there waiting for the printer to become free. And I didn't... First, I thought it was rude to tell, no one wants to hear about your book in progress. And also, there should be things that are kept secret. There should be things that are allowed to develop um, with the artist alone and, and, and not um, exposed until they're fully baked. But think. you did manage to keep this secret for 20 years? Well, for 18. I told my, my friend at about 15 years in, and that was a good idea because having someone to actually read the pages makes, makes it easier. Uh, but um, it was a much harder book to write. There's a great deal of science. Mm -hmm. You know, like most Americans, I'm scientifically illiterate, so I had to really learn a great deal about modern biology very fast. Um, it's structurally more complicated than the second book. It has footnotes. Um, and I also had to wait for the character upon, the person upon whom the character is based to die. And that took a while. <laughs> I didn't want to get sued. So he didn't die until the early 2000s. And um, that was always my excuse. I was waiting for them uh, to exit stage left. Um, the second book, um, you know, I probably, your second book is easier. You know what your flaws are as a writer. You know how to overcome them. I was older. I had a greater sense of discipline. Um, and I loved these characters. And I, and I loved inhabiting this world. And I knew it. Well, I, I, I felt that I really knew where I was going with this novel. I um, enjoyed spending time in the world I created, and um, and I felt that I had something urgent to say. And this is very pretentious sounding, but I do feel that for fiction writers, you have to feel that you have something urgent to say, and that only you can say it. And if you're just going to write a novel to write a novel, it's probably not going to be that interesting. And the most <coughs> damning thing you can say about a novel is that it was just okay, that it was, that it was born. Yeah. And I knew that this book, for whatever its flaws, wouldn't be born. It would be many other things, problematic things, but born wouldn't be one of them. So you weren't uh, surprised by the, by the response because nobody can stay mm -hmm. indifferent uh, to this book. Well, I, was, I am hugely surprised by the response. Um, it has been... I think it's been surprising for everyone involved in it. And it, my hope for this book was that it would find a small group of readers who felt that it was something that was speaking to them alone. And we've all had that experience with a piece of art, whether it's a movie or, or, or a painting or a photograph or a book, where you find it and you think, this book has said something that I didn't know how to articulate. It's answered something within me that I didn't know how to ask. And I felt that if I found a few readers who felt that way, 
then I would have been successful. Oh, well, you see it. It's, 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 uh, <laughs> and the fact that there have been more readers than I think mm. anyone anticipated has been deeply shocking for everyone involved. And, and just the most honoring and humbling of surprises. And it's something that... And it's a surprise that came slowly. Very because slowly. In, in the very beginning it was not Direct, not immediate uh, success. Yes, yes, and so it's a pleasure, you know, as someone who used to work in book publishing, when you have a book that really is a book that is passed from booksellers to readers and readers to readers. And there's nothing um, rarer or more um, exciting than knowing that someone has bought your book and spent time with it. Mm -hmm. there is, there's, there's no greater communion, I think, um, as an artist, that's what everyone hopes for. And to have people who have taken it, read it seriously and passionately, and if, with such generosity, has been a great shock. And if anyone tells you they know how it happened, they're lying. No one knows how it happened, and no one ever does. Um, the reactions on, on your book begin, actually, when people only look at the cover. Mm. Um, it's a photo. <laughs> from uh, 1969 by an American uh, photographer, Peter, Peter Hujar, uh, titled Orgasmic Man. Mm -hmm. uh, your publisher, Doubleday, in, in America, wasn't very enthusiastic. No, you... that's an understatement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they refused it. They did refuse it. They did refuse it. And I almost walked away from the deal because they refused it. Because of that? Yes, because of that. I felt powerfully about this, this, uh, this cover. As, as you said, it's, um, it was taken in 1969 by Peter Hujar. I don't know how many of you know his work, but he was a contemporary of um, David Wojnarowicz's and Keith Haring's and Chen Kuang Chi's. He was part of the great AIDS activist and artist movement of the 1970s through early 80s in New York. And the thing I love about this cover is that when you look at it, it's so visceral. You don't know whether he's in pleasure or in pain. All you know is that you're seeing someone at an unbearably intimate moment of his life. Mm -hmm. And that you are both a trespasser and a witness. And that to me felt very much like how I wanted the book to feel. Mm -hmm. That you're with this character and you're seeing moments you shouldn't see. And you both can't turn away. And it also feels inhuman to want to turn away that you were there to keep him company day after day after day. And so, you know, I, I told my editor that I really wanted this cover, and he said no. And where, then, where did you find uh, this photo? I, I knew his work, um, okay. and it was my best friend who suggested this particular image. And uh, my editor said no, and, he, and I said, why not? And he said, everyone can tell he's coming, but I don't think you can tell he's coming. Uh, you don't really know what's, what's happening. Uh, and uh, so, so in the end, he, uh, he capitulated, as he should have done months before. And um, Peter Boudreau actually has a show coming, a retrospective coming next year uh, to Amsterdam. So uh, okay. anyone, and it'll come here before it comes to New York. So if any of you haven't seen his work before, it's really, really beautiful. And he's known for this series of orgasmic and there are others in this series as well. And has he said something to you afterwards, uh, your, your publisher? Yeah, well, I, I, saw, I saw my publisher, and this is after the book was becoming sort of a modest success, and you know they were very happy because they hadn't paid me anything for it. And, um, <laughs> and I said, well, the cover's really worked, hasn't it? And he said, the cover's fucking horrible. You know, <laughs> everyone hates it. The booksellers hate it. The, pub, you know, the sales reps hate it. It's, become so, it's so awful that it's become iconic. And obviously my publishers here agreed because, uh, you know, after their reservations, they, <laughs> they also capitulated. <laughs> uh, well, in, in the first hundred, well, perhaps 150 pages, you, you tell the story of these four young men, Jude, Jamie, Willem, and Malcolm in New York. Little money, great expectations, uh, strong opinions. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Jude uh, cuts himself by accident mm. in the hand. Uh, that has something to do with his past about which he doesn't reveal much at that moment, uh, even to his close friends. So this looks like, this looks like, a, like a story about friendship mm. and ambition. 
perhaps one of the many novels about young people in New York. Um, just like you, you wait a long time before the description of his tragical youth actually begins. Um, do you consider those first hundred pages as a manner of, of teasing uh, the readers in order to take him in hostage afterwards? I like that. Uh, yes, I mean, I think the book does have a slight of hand quality to it, and as you begin it, it does feel, I hope, like a beloved literary subgenre, which is the post-collegiate New York novel that many people have written very well. And, um, but, you know, that is what life feels like often when you're in your 20s. You're not far enough from your childhood to make sense of it and how it's affected you. Mm -hmm. And you are hopeful. You are optimistic. You know less about yourself. You know less about the world. And New York, I think, in particular, is a place where people go because who you were doesn't matter. It's about who you are now and who you might become. And then, as you get to the second part of the book, you realize it might not be that novel. It might not be um, a, a sort of post-collegiate romp. It might be a character study. And then as the book continues, I hope it gets darker and darker and darker. And the, you know, I told my editor two things. I said, first, I wanted it to feel like an ombre cloth. And of course, ombre is a way of dying. So you begin with it's a very life, ombre. It's, so it's a method of dying fabric. Mm -hmm. So it begins very pale on one end and shades to very dark on the other. And that's how I wanted it to feel tonally. And I also wanted the reader to feel, you know, like, this is a metaphor I use a lot, but like a lobster in a pot, and you turn up the heat and the lobster slowly dies. And it's not really aware of it. Uh, and, and that's also how I wanted the book to feel as it, as it unfolded, but I wanted it to feel leisurely. And then I think at some point midway through, you, you understand that it's a thriller, and it, it, my reader called it an emotional thriller, which I think is correct. And then it becomes a mystery, and yet it's also kind of a fairy tale. So I think it's, I think it moves between many sorts of genres and borrows from many sorts of genres to, I hope, make a book that feels a little bit um, uh, like, like a magical creature, something that's been knit together from many different parts and is a little bit unnameable and a little bit uncapturable, like a sphinx in a sense. And how did those days look like when you wrote this in 18 months? Days of, or from nine till well, I had a job at the time, so but I only worked four days a week, which was wonderful. And so I wrote from 9 p.m. to midnight, Monday through Thursday, and I wrote for six hours a day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And when you have a job, it, it does help you structure your days, and it gives you also a place to go to get away from the life of the book, and that was very helpful as well. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but but it was, it was a great book to leave in the morning and also a wonderful thing to come back to at night. So did you write this second book also secretly? They didn't know? Mm, more more or less, jobs. yes. Um, I, I would tell people that I was working on something, but no one wants to hear about your book. Well, and they, they thought, well, over in 15 years this year. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, this book hadn't come out yet, and, um, and that's the best time to write something, when your first book's been bought, and so someone is, has some faith in you, and yet you're completely free. You're not writing against critics, you're not writing against sales, you're only writing because you want to write, or, or you must write, or however you want to put it. Uh, so it's not like there were people asking me what I was working on, no one cared. And, um, and that's a very sweet moment to write that, I think. <laughs> was there any moment that it was uh, too much for you? There are a couple of sections. The hardest sections to write were the Dr. Trailer section, which comes at the end of the fifth part, and all of part six was very, very difficult to write. Uh, because by this point, I was so invested in, in June, I knew what would happen. I knew how his story would end, and I knew the sort of suffering he had to go through to get there. And um, it's, it's maddening. So you worked with a plan, you knew where, yes. where, where it would end. Yes, I did. And, um, and I knew there were some deviations and some detours, but the idea that I had about how you would get there pretty much stayed intact. So when it came, came time to write the very end of part five, for those of you who have read it, and for those of you who haven't, I won't say, and, and all of part six, it was very hard because I knew where I had to go and, um, and I didn't really want to, 
but they were also the fastest sections to write. They were very, very easy to do in that sense. In, in so far as um, Jude is a character with a limited imagination and with a very fixed sense of logic. And so when you have a character like that, who never really develops, who never really changes the way he thinks about the world, um, it, it's, it's it, it, that consistency um, is, it, is, makes for a nice roadmap, I think. And did you stay yourself cool while writing? In retrospect, probably not. Um, I didn't really talk to anyone except for my best friend during the writing of this. I didn't go out, obviously, because I was writing. Um, it was, it was, uh, in, in, in retrospect, I, I can see it was, it was a very difficult period of my life. Mm. And um, you've been praised uh, for your style, for your book, but also you've been criticized uh, on the depiction of violence. Mm. Um, and even accused of manipulation of the reader, which sounds a bit strange mm. as a reproach, as if not every author mm. uh, does this in a way. But can you understand the feeling of some uh, reviewers, of some readers, that uh, it is too much? Mm. I, I think, you know, I don't read reviews, so I don't, I can't speak specifically to anything, but I do understand the criticism, and I think yeah. there's not read any review. Never, not for this one, and not for this, or not for the other one. I just don't think it. I don't think it helps matters. Um, <laughs> well, you know, a very a brilliant writer I know once told me the good ones are never good enough, and the bad ones stay with you forever. And it makes you more self-absorbed. Writers are very self-absorbed, and reading reviews makes you more self-absorbed. Anyway, but you're not curious uh, if there's a discussion about your book. I think all you can hope for is that people read it seriously. How they react to it beyond that, I, I simply can't control. And what's been more meaningful to me, and I know this sounds like a lie, but what's been more meaningful to me is that people have read it seriously. They've engaged with it fully. And they've had reactions, and those reactions are passionate. And that's all you can hope for. You know, like we were talking earlier, you never want someone to finish reading something and shrug. And, and, and say, well, that was good enough, or yeah. that was that was fine. I think fine or nice or okay are the three most damning assessments that we can have. Some many. some kind of uh, some some sort of it's uh, it is a, even a compliment if someone is irritated or. I think so. Yeah. I think so. It means that they have really read it closely. Felt something. Yes, and they read <laughs> it and they read it fully. Yeah. And so I think that the idea of there being too much violence in in a book, let's say in this book in particular, I think there's one argument that's specious and one argument that's interesting. The one that's ridiculous, I think, is this idea that the reader can't handle a certain amount of violence, which, you know, an author is not there to be a reader's parent, and the reader doesn't need to be policed. Whenever a reader enters the life of a book, she is making, um, it, it is an act of bravery, it is an act of surrender, it is an act of, it is an act of, um, of you know, a willful jumping off of a cliff. And as a reader myself, I don't want to ever feel like the writer is holding back something, is keeping something from me because she thinks that I'm not uh, equipped enough emotionally to take it. A reader can always close the book if it becomes too much for her. The other argument, the aesthetic argument, about whether I, th I think violence can tip into pornography in a book is, I think, a valid question and is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. I think there are books and there are all sorts of art that fetishize violence, that use the repetition of violence and brutality um, not to prove a point um, or to advance the story or to create a character, but only to titillate. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is that violence that leaves you feeling um, not just unsettled, but leaves you asking why, that leaves you with more questions, that leaves you with considering the violence not just as an act, but as, as something larger, as something more meaningful, is not only appropriate, but necessary. And my explanation to my editor... Is that what you meant earlier with something urgent to say? Not only, but it could be. And my argument to my editor was that some lives are very violent lives, some lives are very brutal lives. It is the fiction writer's responsibility to show all sorts of lives, even if those lives are unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And I wanted the reader to not be able to forget that these are the realities of Jude's life. 
that he is terrible to himself and he does terrible things. That an addiction is a way of destroying the body. It's a way of reclaiming the body by destroying the body. And I hope that the violence is not just something that is shocking to the reader, but a reminder to the reader that violence marks people's days. It's a metronome for many people. It is what they wake up to, it is what they go to bed to. And in that sense, as an exploration of what it means to be human in all of its senses, I think it earns its place here. And you, um, you, you just said that it's horrible what he does, mm. um, but at the same time he has friends, mm. doctors, uh, people who care about him, uh, he has a good job. Mm. Um, all the time you keep our hope warm that some change will is possible. Mm. Um, did you feel the same because you just said that you already knew uh, where it would end? I did know what, where, where it would end, but I also feel that a life that is such an unhappy life at times, as Jude's is, has moments of grace, as I think almost all lives do. And we're very intolerant, I think, of people who we feel can't make more of those moments of grace for themselves, or can't let those moments of grace count for more than the misery and the agony. And I think that that's a reductive way of thinking about the measure of somebody's life. I hope that I gave you qualities that I think are necessary for humans to have. I gave him, as you said, the capacity to love and be loved. I gave him um, the, I gave him a sense of dignity that he gives, gets from his job and from his friends. I gave him things that are essential to life, but even things that are elemental to life are sometimes not enough to sustain a life. And uh, at, at the end of the book, um, after he, he lost his uh, friend, he concludes, uh, people don't change. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I read in, in many reviews, I, mm -hmm. I can tell you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll <laughs> summarize it for you. Uh, <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Uh, Jude is too much uh, damaged to be able to experience love in his life. Um, I'm curious to know if you agree with him, people don't change, because uh, the circumstances can change your view on that uh, gloomy conclusion. I think people can change. I mean, JB is a character who changes greatly throughout the course of the book. Mm -hmm. He's one of these, the character um, for whom goodness, um, it, it doesn't come naturally. It's not a natural talent of his. He has to work hard at it. He has to really think about what it means to be a good friend and an ethical person. But I do think for some people who have experienced the sort of trauma that Jude has at the age he has as a young child, it's very difficult to try to learn in adulthood the things that you really need to, um, to want to stay alive, you know, a sense of anger, a sense of entitlement. If you're a child and bad things keep happening to you, and there's no other reason but bad luck, that's almost an unbearable concept for anyone, a child or an adult, to understand. You almost want it to be something that you've deserved or something you've earned, because so much of what we're taught in life is that we do get what we deserve, we do get what we earn. And so, if you sustain terrible things, what must that say about you? It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very contradictory way to think about the world and your place in it, I think. And, and uh, uh, the last uh, chapter is by far the shortest. Mm. Um, you could have taken your time for that chapter as well. <laughs> Did you? No, that, I wrote it very, very fast. Yes. And, um, and, and, I, and I knew it exactly wrote it in a weekend, actually. So, and, um, and uh, because I had what I was going to say in mind, I had those last lines. Um, that really did feel very natural for me to do. So then in one weekend you are finished. I was done, yeah. And then, how did you feel? Well, bereft, you know, I mean, I, I think that when I finished this book, I felt a sense of loss because I did love this world yeah. and I do love these characters and when you finish any sort of creative project you think well that's it I'm going to move on and it often doesn't work like that any book that you've or any creative world 
any fictional world that you have invested in so deeply and that you've lived in so, um, I, I guess, so seriously uh, is not really yours to leave. It's, it, you can try to lift yourself out of it, but, but you kind of can't. And um, it hasn't been until, you know, I finished this book in 2013 and, it's, and I still think about these characters and, and what they might be saying and what they might be doing. And it's been a burden, and it's also been, um, it's, it's, it feels like, um, since the book is no longer mine, it belongs to the readers, it does feel that the world is still mine. <laughs> and you've, uh, it, it took you uh, 18 months, mm -hmm. and it's 18 months ago that mm -hmm. this book was published. Yeah, I guess so. So does this mean that you just finished <laughs> a similar <laughs> no, well, and you know, the thing is that uh, the book has recently been optioned for a television series, so if it gets bought, then I'll, oh. I'll be back in the world in a much more intense way, and, um, and I hope that happens, but, but I'm not sure. They're choosing the actor. Not even, we just need to trick someone into giving us $20 million to make <laughs> So if anyone's willing, come see me after. <laughs> Uh, will you read uh, something for us? No, thank you. <laughs> Why not? I don't read Dutch. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> well, 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 there's the translators here. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you don't prefer to, to read I, I just, I, I don't really see the point of it. Um, I, I think that some readers, some writers are wonderful readers, I'm not one of them. <laughs> Uh, when an author reads, we can hear his rhythm. I don't have any rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> then I, I give it up. <laughs> Will you sign your book? Yes, absolutely. Oh, that's, okay. that's a promise. Yes. Uh, we have uh, a, few, a few questions from the audience. Three questions. I think I can see you there. Um, my name is Ruud Dreyer. Um, what uh, what uh, the question on my mind is: uh, What triggered you to create a person like Jude? I wanted to write a character who never got better. Who. You know, most characters in most books start off at one point and end at another. And I thought, what would it be like to create somebody who tries and tries and never is able to, to heal himself, which is basically the basis of American culture since the beginning of America. That if you try hard enough, if you work hard enough, if you want it more, more than anybody else, you will be able to become the person you want. And that's simply not true. And I thought, what would be the narrative events and what would be the tension of someone who, and there's a point I think in which the reader realizes he's not going to be able to get better. And, and yet, I hope keeps reading anyway. And so what would be the, the momentum and the thrust and the tension of a book like that? Thank you. So your book is in a certain way an answer or, or a message to, to America, to, to the American dream or... Well, I think it's a very American book in many ways. I think it's an American book because of, because of, of, of what we just discussed, but I also think it's an American book in its iconography, in its motels, in its road trips, you know, in its, in its sense of spaciousness, in the sense that there's so many places to hide in America, that there's so many lives we don't know, that the bigness of the country um, allows people um, to remain undiscovered. And, you know, when I was a child, we drove across the country quite a bit, and we stayed in motels very much like the ones Jude stays in. And I just remember thinking, although I wasn't able to articulate it at the time, about all those itinerant lives that, 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 that America has, all of the people in transit, all of the people um, on the run from their own pasts, and able to create another because the city, because the country is so large and because the country is used to people coming there and remaking themselves. We have a question from the front there. 
Yes. The transformation. <laughs> well, well, that um, we got an applause uh, at the beginning of the interview that wasn't really for us because we didn't translate the first novel, uh, and the translators are here, and it's uh, Inge Lindberg and uh, Lucy von Holm. So uh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question? Um, well, I think uh, I can imagine what you feels like having some sort of defect, or I'm not sure how you word it, but you describe the feeling that he has so well, and I'm curious how you find these words. Well, thank you. I mean, one of the things that I was interested in in the writing of this book is how inadequate our language is for pain. Um, that it's so unsatisfying, that it's so limited, and there's so few words that we have available. And it's the hardest sensation to describe, and people are the, are the most impatient with it. You know, I was a very sick child myself, and one of the things you realize when you're sick or you have a chronic illness, is that the language you invent is, tends to be very personal and maybe understood by one or two people. I had a lot of problems breathing, and I remember saying to my mother that it felt like, um, do you know what a Triska is? Do they have that here? It's a kind of cracker, and it's very rough. When you break it, it's, it almost breaks up into splinters. But that's what breathing felt like. It felt like, like, like a Triska felt when you rubbed your hand across it. And one of the problems that the difficulties that Jude has is somehow feeling that he can't articulate his pain and that he doesn't have the right to articulate his pain. Um, and it's another thing that imprisons him um, and, and, and makes and, and yet becomes another subject that he feels he can't broach. And he finally learns language for it, but it takes him many years. It doesn't really answer your question, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Final one. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Everyone knows that an overwhelming majority of the readers are women. Yet, if one calls the reader a he, you call the reader a yeah. she. Why? Uh, because I'm the reader usually. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and and well, we actually talked about this. Although I'm looking at this audience and it's very mixed, but. The majority of fiction readers are women, and this is true in America, and I think it's probably true everywhere. There are various theories about why that's true, but uh, but the reader is generally a she, I think. Would you agree with that, publishing house? Yeah, they're all nodding. Did you have to force yourself to call the reader a she? No. You have to change the language from he to she. No, I always I always call the reader a she, and let's hope we'll call the president a she, too. <laughs> Why am I such a bitch and did the money through a happier ending? I, I think I was very tempted. Was I ever tempted? I was very tempted. And at the end of part five, for those of you who haven't read it, I almost backed away. And it just felt that any other ending would have been dishonest. I think that um, it, it, it wasn't just because it made logical sense for it, the book to end how, how it is, but I think I would have been um, telling a lie to the reader if I, if I had tried to end it any other way. But I did feel for him. <laughs> she looks unconvinced. <laughs> thank you. Her smile so sweet. Oh, well. um, thank you very much. Thank you so for much. For coming here for thank you. this conversation. Well, thank uh, you. Hanya will, when you go afterwards to the foyer, 
and you will come there and... Uh, and I'll sign all the books if anyone has them. So, <laughs> um, and thank you so much to everyone. Thank you.